Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus again today. I'm Trace. This is episode 4 of 5 on Volcanoes. If you haven't subscribed yet, just take a second, click the little button down there. We really appreciate that. Also, go back and watch the first three episodes in this series because you don't want to miss how volcanoes form and where they form and what's up with their explosions and all sorts of cool stuff about mythology and how it informs modern science. You'd miss all of that if you didn't go back and watch the first three episodes. But today, episode four, we're talking about how volcanoes can affect everybody in the world. Global effects from single eruptions. Volcanoes are the zits on the face of the earth, right? They pop open and they can just affect everything all over the place. Your social standing, your self-esteem, all sorts of great stuff. I'm just kidding about that last bit. Either way, when volcanoes erupt, they are spewing out ash and gas and lava and all sorts of things. And a lot of that, especially the ash, can then go on to affect countries around the world and global cooling. When volcanoes erupt, they can release things like sulfur dioxide, which combines with water in the atmosphere and creates aerosols that absorb incoming solar radiation and then scatter it back out into space. The ash can go into the atmosphere, forming a haze that can travel around the globe, blocking the sunlight from reaching the ground here on Earth. And this was first observed by Benjamin Franklin in 1784 after the Lockheed eruptions in Iceland, an event that produced such a large ash cloud that there was a haze as far away as Siberia. The cloud also contained sulfur dioxide, hydrogen chloride, and hydrogen fluoride. When this mixed with water, it created acid rain, which killed livestock and destroyed crops, and 25% of Iceland's population died due to famine or toxicity from this eruption. And it didn't just affect Iceland, like I said. It affected the entirety of the northern hemisphere of our planet. The temperature decreased by a degree Celsius overall globally, more half of the globe anyway, which honestly doesn't sound like a lot, but it still affects food and the survival of people and can change whole climates. This atmospheric haze can circle the planet within weeks of the volcanic activity that caused it. So, for example, the 1883 eruption of Krakatoa that led to 20 cubic kilometers of haze that was 40 kilometers high. Darkness covered Indonesia and the neighboring islands of Sumatra and Java, and two days later, that haze reached South Africa. And just a week after that, it had circled the globe. So from Indonesia back around the globe, in just a week. And it would continue to do so multiple times before the ash finally lost enough momentum to fall back to the ground and out of the atmosphere. So these explosions, these volcanic eruptions, are serious events, not just for the people who live on their slopes, but for people who live all over the planet. And scientists claim that without the cooling effect of some of these volcanic eruptions, global warming effects caused by humans could have been far more substantial today. Eruptions of volcanoes, of course, do release greenhouse gases like CO2, which contributes to global warming, but they only release about 100 to 300 million tons in a year which might sound like a lot, but only about 1% of the amount that we release because we're horrible, just from fossil fuels alone, by the way. So aside from cooling and warming, ash and aerosol particles can result in some benefits for humans as well, more aesthetically. See, the ash and the aerosols in the atmosphere scatter light, which can cause us to cool or warm, but they can also cause it to look different. They would specifically scatter more red light wavelengths, which can cause some pretty sweet sunsets. And that can inspire artists around the world like British painter William Ashcroft. The eruption of Tambora in Indonesia in 1815 released so much ash and gas that it hit New England and Europe. And they received snowfalls as late as August, leading to massive crop failures. And that was known as a year without a summer. Since it was summer, but it wasn't really summer, Lord Byron invited some of his friends, who were also writers, to spend the summer in Switzerland near Lake Geneva. And at the time, because it was snowing in the summer, they wrote ghost stories for each other's entertainment. And one of those stories was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So without that volcano, we might not have had one of these classic human stories. Volcanic eruptions also affect airplanes and air travel. I mean, technology does not like it when there's particles in the air and there's little chunks of things flying at it. 
it's not work out very well. Volcanic ash contains tiny glass particles and pulverized rocks, which can erode the blades of the compressor in a jet engine, and that compressor is needed to increase air pressure, causing significant damage if it doesn't work. And it also has problems with the combustion chamber, which can, you know, solidify onto the turbine blades and it can block airflow and stall out the engine which means you fall out of the sky which is not ideal for air travel and it can also you know block the pilot's view as simple as that and that means that they can't fly as easily it can pollute cabin air which can cause problems erode external components and cause more wear and tear on the aircraft essentially there's a lot of bad stuff that can happen just with airplanes related to volcanoes and aside from the pretty sunsets and the thrill-seeking tourism and frankenstein there is another thing that volcanoes can do for humanity, and that is we can harness their power. We live in the future, guys. Geothermal energy is just awesome. Engineers can take hot, briny groundwater from the volcanoes and then convert that to steam to power turbines, bringing that energy then into the power grid. And this isn't just a theory. Geothermal energy is happening around the world. In Iceland, it's huge. It's great for places like Costa Rica and Hawaii. The big island of Hawaii, for example, gets around half of its energy from the renewable resource of geothermal due to their own geothermal plant, the Puna Geothermal Venture, which sits near Kilauea, they can produce enough energy to power 4,400 homes every month. And we know what you're thinking, building a power plant near a volcano kind of sounds dangerous, and you're right, it kind of is. Volcanoes are inherently dangerous, but luckily, Kilauea probably is not gonna erupt anytime soon. But what is actually dangerous isn't the volcano so much is the drilling of the wells to build the plants. If they hit a really hot spot underneath the ground, high pressure steam could blow out, causing what's called appropriately a blowout, and release harmful amounts of hydrogen sulfide and of course damage the equipment and potentially hurt people. The Big Island though was created by a volcano, so it's a resource that's there. It's perfect to drill into that for energy and that heat is from the earth. I mean, every power plant that we have ever been able to construct as humans essentially converts one type of energy into another, usually mechanical energy, a turbine, like a wind turbine. That's the easiest way to do it. Water is just converting it, moving it to a turbine. Nuclear energy heats up water that turns into steam, turns a turbine. So why not use the Earth's own heat? The island was created in something called hotspot volcanism, by the way. We haven't really talked too much about what happens to make certain places on Earth volcanic. The process of hotspot volcanism has to do with tectonic plates. The Pacific tectonic plate has a line right where Hawaii is, which is why the islands do form this kind of line. And after each eruption, magma cools and hardens under the water, and eventually it'll penetrate the ocean surface and form an island. That island is then made essentially of leftover volcano eruptions. And as the Earth's tectonic plates shift off of that hot spot in between the tectonic plates or with a fissure or a crack or something, then you end up with an island chain. On top of that, volcanic eruptions, as I mentioned earlier, release a lot of minerals, causing a lot of really great soil in that region, because the soil then contains magnesium and potassium and iron. And that steady supply of nutrients is great for plant life. On top of that, volcanic minerals can be harvested and used to create uh, household cleaners, cements, metal polishes, plaster, metal, machinery, electronics, medicines. Gems and minerals can be harvested from volcanic areas. And of course, we have the last and maybe the most important thing that is good about volcanic effects on the Earth is that it created Earth's atmosphere. 4.6 billion years ago, Volcanic outgassing, gas released from a volcano, volcano farts, collected around the surface of the planet and created an atmosphere that contained hydrogen sulfide, methane, and up to 200 times more CO2 than is in today's atmosphere. A half a billion years later, the Earth cooled off a bit and enough that water could collect into the atmosphere as well. So then the atmosphere was composed of water vapor, ammonia, and carbon dioxide much of which was then dissolved into the oceans as they began to form, where, eventually, cyanobacteria developed and released oxygen as a byproduct. Without the help from volcanoes, we may have never had an atmosphere that we could breathe. Volcanoes are like the bringer and taker of life, and also heat energy and minerals and household cleaners and a bunch of other stuff. But if they can do that here, if they can create an atmosphere here and do stuff, cool stuff here on our planet. What about space volcanoes? 
<laughs> yeah. Because this is Test Tube Plus. We're going there. Guys, we're always looking for new episodes for Test Tube Plus and new things to talk about. If you have any ideas and make sure that they can be a whole big podcast, let us know down in the comments and we'll try and get to them in the coming weeks. Also, come find us over on Twitter. You can find the show at Test Tube. You can find me at Trace Dominguez. You can also find the show as a podcast over on iTunes. We are a 45-minute, roughly, audio podcast if you just want to listen while you drive or something like that. So check that out as well. Thanks for tuning in this week. We'll see you tomorrow for one last episode of Volcanoes on Test Tube Plus. Oh.